Hello, everybody. I'm Lucy Robbins, and welcome to the Reality Therapy Corner. Uh, this is a um, opportunity that we have once a month to get together and discuss and have conversations around reality therapy. And we're well, we're glad to have you all here, and welcome. Uh, last, this is our second session. Last session we had Gloria Cisse, and she taught us about not taught us, but led us in a conversation about inclusion and diversity. And in that conversation, she gave us a definition of social location. And social location is defined as a, the combination of factors, including gender, race, social class, age, ability, re religion, sexual orientation, and geog geographic location. So what we are going to do today is a little connecting activity is ask you uh, viewers, if you will, to put your social location into the chat so that we know you, where you, maybe where uh, your state location, any social information that you'd like to share with us. We discussed that this is generally social location our quality world pictures of ourselves, which Glasser said was our most important pictures. Um, so it, you can do it seriously, or you can do it in a fun or cute way, or just any way you want to do it. For instance, I might put up that I'm a Native American princess and a an gas and oil heiress. Now, not a lot of people know that about me, but it's both are true in their own way. Well, let me go here now. Today, each month we have a featured guest to lead our discussions or our conversations. And our guest, featured guest today is Mike Fulkerson. <coughs> Excuse me, Mike. Mike is the senior faculty member at the of uh, at the William Glasser Institute, and he's a licensed professional clinical counselor. He's also an author. He's authored a couple of books and articles. And one of his books, and the one I'm most, most familiar with, is Print and Planning with Choice Theory and Reality Therapy. Mike and I have known each other about 12 or 13 years, something along that way. He was in one of my classes during his training, and we got along just great and have been friends and connecting with each other ever since. So it's my pleasure to, uh, oh, one more thing. You'll notice this as soon as he starts talking, Mike has a great voice and a great singing voice and has been seen doing Elvis imitations before. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and I'm gonna join in as a participant uh, which I ask and encourage each of you to do, to join Mike in this conversation and your questions and thoughts and comments as he goes along. So Mike, I'm turning it over to you now. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Lucy. Um, Lucy has been a, a mentor and um, has, has been a source of a lot of learning for me over the years and continues to be. So uh, as a privilege and honor to be here today and to talk some about uh, reality therapy, uh, choice theory. Uh, I got involved with the um, Institute for Reality Therapy quite young as an undergraduate student. There were two uh, courses that you could take in reality therapy that counted as like 40% of your certification. So I got exposed uh, at, a, at a very young age to these ideas and uh, was able, actually able to certify as an undergrad, which I believe really gave me kind of a head start heading into graduate school because I had something to compare all the other different counseling methods to. Uh, it, learning, uh, and it was, it, it was just quite helpful to see how it compared to other methods and, um, uh, I, I believe uh, has uh, been a, a key with uh, any job that I've had since getting my degrees. Uh, I, wor I worked at a crisis hotline, found the ideas useful there, um, worked in a 
Children's Psychiatric Hospital and um, used reality therapy a lot doing individual groups and family therapy. And then I worked for a, a, a domestic violence shelter for a period of time and uh, found the, the method of reality th therapy helpful with both um, people that are survivors of domestic violence and also those who have used domestic violence. Um, and then for the last uh, uh, about 18 years, I have been more in supervision and, and management. So have uh, found these ideas just as useful as a manager and a supervisor. And that's what I do mostly now is, is train and supervise uh, clinicians. Um, a number of students that have their bachelor's degree uh, are uh, working towards getting a license. I, I manage a program called Community Support Services. So many of my supervisees are in the process of getting their uh, license, either in social work or counseling, psychology. Um, so it, it's uh, uh, a, a great job for someone who's a senior faculty member with the Glasser Institute because you've got uh, people that are they're, they're trying to figure out their counselor identity and um, uh, reality therapy is a good self, uh, good skill set to have as a, as a counselor, regardless of what population you're working with, at least in my opinion, that's been the experience. So um, one of the things that I guess to kind of get the uh, discussion started was, uh, or what I'm, I guess, most known for is writing uh, the book, Treatment Plan with Choice Theory and Reality Therapy. And uh, the thing that I found most challenging as a first year therapist, just coming right out of graduate school was doing treatment planning. Uh, it wasn't really covered in the classes. And I remember you know, feeling prepared to do individual and group therapy. I was ready for all that, but well, my supervisor asked me, have you ever written a treatment plan? I said, no. See, he had to sit down with me and show me how to write measurable outcomes. And, and I got it and I got to be, to be a pretty good at fact, we had a, a unexpected inspection one time and um, the uh, chart review committee pulled my charts because they knew they were up, up date. So, so uh that got the attention of a lot of administration at that point. And um, what I learned from that is that sometimes your documentation is the only thing that some people will receive your work. And so that, that I think that was an important lesson for me to learn very early on. Uh, how treatment planning was done during that time though, I had a bit of a problem with because how we were trained to do treatment planning was to uh, using the diagnosis refer to a treatment planning book and find goals, objectives related to that diagnosis that you think are best gonna fit your client. <laughs> and the problem I have with that is that oftentimes what was being listed on the treatment plans didn't, didn't necessarily reflect what was gonna be done in therapy. Uh, also, it, was, it seemed very medical model and you might have two clients with the same diagnosis that you'd want to take completely different uh, uh, approaches with. So the way that I did treatment planning was really having the client lead it, having the person I was working with, asking them, what do you want in your treatment plan? What would you like to get from services? How do you see me helping you? And, and using the, the five basic needs of choice theory as that diagnostic schema, uh, not that the diagnosis was important. The diagnosis was important because it gives you the description of what are some of the organized acting, thinking, feeling, and physiological behaviors you may be seeing with uh, the person you're working with. But this seemed to make more sense to use those 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 basic needs as the diagnostic uh, schema. And I, I approached this with my clinical supervisors about you know I want to I want I think I want to write a book because I don't I, I see all these treatment planning approaches, but uh, they don't really fit what I'm doing. And she told me, said, well, you can't do that. 
you have to have the diagnosis guiding your treatment plan. That's not how treatment plans, you can't do that. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, well, just watch me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so, uh, but then on the other side, there were uh, some people practicing reality therapy said, you know, you really can't measure what we do in a treatment plan. So I was getting really kind of questioned on, on both sides. And I, I was just kind of working on this uh, manuscript. And it was in 2013, Kim Olver, who was executive director of the Glasser Institute, sends out an email looking for information on how to do documentation and treatment planning using choice theory of therapy. And I thought, well, what the heck? I'll, I'll, I'll send in what I got. Because apparently, no one had really written about that ex very extensively. And uh, so, uh, but they had, I mean, all the other uh, senior faculty that have written extensively on reality therapy said, if you find it, let, let us know. <laughs> so uh, I responded to Kim's email. Uh, she responded back and said, this is just what I'm looking for. And uh, so that's, that's where it all started. Uh, and uh, the book started as just like an ebook on the, the Glasser website, and I ended up uh, continue uh, continually updating it. And uh, person-centered recovery planning uh, was coming into the picture because uh, it, it was about uh, 2014, 2015. Uh, one of my I'm telling one of my supervisors about the the, the book, and he said, "Well, that sounds a lot like person-centered recovery planning, where you." use the Maslow's hierarchy of needs rather than the, the diagnosis as your central guidance mechanism and treatment planning. And, and it's just like now mental health is catching up with kind of what I was doing all along. Except what I did was flip it and rather than using Maslow's hierarchy of needs, using Glasser's, uh, the needs of choice theory as that diagnostic, diagnostic schema. And I, I got trained in person-centered recovery planning. In fact, uh, I, I went to a training by the lady, who, one of the people who developed person-centered recovery planning and reality therapy is so uh, applicable to person-centered recovery planning. I believe it's one of the better ways of, uh, of doing it. So that's a little bit about my background and how I got to be where I am. So um, if uh, I, I'll, I'll kind of open it up to, uh, to questions, if anyone would like. What do you think is the best tool of reality therapy and treatment planning? Uh, what you know, one thing that needs to be done before treatment planning is having a good case conceptualization, or in some agencies, what's called an interpretive summary. And what we have with reality therapy, it's backed up by a very sound theory, choice theory, which justifies why we do what we do. So I train clinicians. You do the biopsych social, which is you know, the comprehensive history of your clients. And you have this treatment plan, but in between, you need a good interpretive summary or case conceptualization where you look at this case through a theoretical lens. And having that, that theory to really base everything that we do. Uh, I, I put together a little worksheet that, that goes through uh, uh, developing treatment, like questions I, to, to ask. Uh, and um, one of the things that person-centered recovery planning encourages is putting the goals in the client's own words. It, th those are called life goals. So I noticed L-I-E-F, almost spells out the first letters of the basic needs. So I added S, apostrophe S to it, and you got it. Life's needs, love and belonging, uh, inner control or power, freedom, independence, enjoyment, fun, and survival, and your health needs. So that makes it even easier. So now when clinicians are putting a life goal into their treatment plan, they can just think life's goal, think about the five basic needs. and that is a real, uh, very helpful in getting the quality world pictures of the client, which is gonna direct the, the, the treatment plan. Yeah. 
I haven't heard that one before. That's a good one. Say it one mm -hmm. more time. Life's life. Right. So you have a, like a, a life's goal, which is going to be what the client wants from the, the question I have on my worksheet is, what are you looking for from your treatment? What do you want from your services, your therapy? And sometimes they may be able to give you uh, a lot of information. Sometimes not. They may say, I don't know. And that's one of the criticisms of person-centered recovery planning is, well, what if the client doesn't know what they want? Or what if they, they give you something that just is inappropriate that you can't put on a treatment plan? For instance, one lady said she went in her, her treatment plan. Uh, uh, I want to take care of the case manager. <laughs> so obviously, <laughs> Freud would say there's some transference going on there. So, so, okay. So what we do is then go beyond that and look at the life's needs. So L, love and belonging. Check out the relationships. Listen for relationships. I, inner control. Um, what gives this person a sense of meaning and purpose in their life? Uh, that's part of inner control. Um, what are some things they want to accomplish? That would be part of inner control. Freedom, that's the F, or independence, or as Piaget called it, autonomy, the ability to stand on one's own feet. You know, maybe they want to find a job or uh, uh, be able to pay the rent. Uh, enjoyment or fun. What are some ways to put fun and enjoyment in your life that does not lead to getting in trouble? And then S, the apostrophe S for survival or health needs. What do they have some health related goals such as improving their diet or getting more sleep? And so that is uh, that diagnostic schema is more understandable to the clients and always made more sense to me to do treatment planning that way because clients, you may have uh, three clinicians who cannot agree on a diagnosis, but almost everyone can agree what are some of the, the values or quality rule pictures related to the needs that are, that are missing, that the client's reporting is missing in their lives or that they wanna to add to in their life. So um, the, uh, the, the life's goal. And then another, one of the criticisms of person recovery planning is that some insurance companies want goals to be measurable, even though in, in lots of trains you go to, goals are supposed to be more broad and vague, but insurance companies want them to be measurable. So how do you, you deal with that with personal recovery planning? Because most people do not speak in measurable terms. <laughs> They're gonna give a lot of times maybe some vague information. Like the lady was referring to, she said, you wanna take care of the case manager. So we followed up, well, uh, why is that important to you? Uh, what would that do for you? And she said, well, it would it, it, it help her feel like she's doing something important. It would give her a sense of like meaning in her life. That's what she really wanted. So that's what we can then, we nailed the life goal right there is that helping this person find some meaning and purpose in her life. Um, so. Um, Mike, when I was doing alcohol and drug work, I was there for 34 years and I had mm -hmm. to look at a lot of treatment plans. I wish I had your book back then. I went into one agency and I was going through his cases of a uh, counselor's cases. And I noticed that two of the treatment plans looked exactly alike. And I thought this must, he must have twins here, you know, right. and then, was, then I went through the rest of them and all of them were exactly alike because he had no concept of the, just the, the, the piece of the treatment plan is the client's life. It, so exactly. Like yes. With person recovery planning, treatment plans should be individualized. And if you're using the quality world pictures, you're going to get that because no one has a quality world that looks exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and then about the measure, measurability, if an uh, insurance company needs something measurable, then we follow that up with, okay, this is what you want. You want meaning and purpose. You want to find meaning and purpose in your life. How will you know when you have that to the point that our services are going to be winding down. So if you've got a service that lasts, uh, like I, I, I manage community support services, our services last about six months, maybe a year. So we're going to take that life goal and then say, within the next six months to maybe a year, how will you know when you will have reached 
achieved your quality world picture or goal. And so then you can add what's called a treatment goal, service delivery goal to keep the insurance companies happy. So when the uh, Council for Accreditation for uh, Rehabilitation Facilities comes into our work site and they wanna see person-centered recovery planning with the goals in the client's own words, we have that. We have the life, the life's, the life's goal. And then just below that, we have the service delivery goal to keep the insurance companies happy. Yeah. Okay. And, and then your objectives are gonna be the steps to get there. Uh, so these are gonna be the steps to kind of get there. And then interventions is how we're gonna use our therapy to, to, assist, to assist the client. And um, with person-centered recovery planning, strengths are supposed to be on the treatment plan, which is right in the wheelhouse of reality therapy because Glasser had always, always uh, taught build on strengths. It's easier to help people use organized behaviors and create completely new ones. And so we have that. And um, I was saying, it's, I, I believe one of the better ways of doing person-centered re recovery, recovery planning. Yeah. Mike, you Mike James had his hand up. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, James. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, James. Well, <laughs> hey, Mike. I'm just, I'm really glad to um, hear your presentation and I'm sold. I'm going to buy your book. <laughs> Good job on the sales pitch. Um, I'm teasing. But, uh, well, you know, it, it's a major problem, uh, especially for people like I did five years in the state system and then I came back out into the field and again, in, uh, came back out into private counseling and um, everything had changed again different insurance companies wanted different things, uh, Medicaid wanted different things. And it, supposedly you're supposed to be using the techniques that were on their approved list. Mm -hmm. uh, and choice theory wasn't on there. Mm -hmm. You know, dialectical behavioral therapy was and mindfulness was, but when I asked them, you know, for clarification on those things, they, they had no idea. But now, mm -hmm. and that was after we, got them to make a list other than behavioral techniques mm -hmm. that was their original list that they said were um uh, approved um techniques mm -hmm. they were all behavioral so um today what i'm experiencing is that as i work for different uh agencies doing private counseling they're moving to really elaborate um EHR systems, electronic health records. And a couple of them have really bare bones systems, but a couple of them have really elaborate systems. And the bare bones systems are helpful to me in the sense that I can do the plan, treatment plan or a basic plan um, as I want to. But in the EHR systems that are more elaborate, you, you really can't. You, you know, you have to um, basically word a a paragraph or two just right and then put it on a word document uh, and download it into the system and the language that they're using for the notes in these more elaborate systems you know it's a lot of um click here click here click there um you just click on the word and when you click on the word it writes a sentence for you mm -hmm. and it is, it is not choice theory language at all mm -hmm. You know, and in fact, I'm not sure what language it is, but it's almost like some foreign language because it's, you know, <laughs> wow. Um, client feels good about themselves today when you know the, the word you click on is, um, you know, disposition or something, and it says, and then the sentence is, "Client feels good today," you know, or something like that. So yeah. it's just ridiculous and takes you nowhere. And anybody that's reviewing the note has nothing, no I idea what went on in the session or what the what's going on with the client. And so I really keyed in on your aspect of, um, you know, making that narrative uh, personalized and, mm -hmm. uh, and going from there. And the, the, the question, so I have a question too, Mike, as I was listening to you, one of the things that I don't know if I'm getting hung up on it or if um, it's, if I should be getting hung up, hung up on it or not, but literally, you know, there's the old phrase in choice theory that no matter what they come in the office with, it's about a relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, 
they can come in with a lot of different things. I see military people and um, recruiters and people who are running um, equipment depots and weapons depots and all this other stuff and working on airplanes and and then people who are just in business and marriage counseling and stuff like that. But it's for me and that thing that statement runs clear. And so I, where I get caught is I don't know if I'm being unique enough with that person in their needs and you know helping them meet get what they want uniquely, um, or if um, a generic plan sometimes with you know this therapy is going towards increasing need fulfilling relationships um, is is sufficient a plan mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. is my question coming clear I'm not uh, no. uh, Seth, you I'm mind not, just I'm, saying I'm the a little question vague, in a I think. couple of words? What's that? Could you say that? Could you restate the question in just a few as few words yeah. as you could? Um, is is there a boundary between the uniqueness of their situation and the objective of reality therapy to bring person toward need fulfilling relationships? Okay, is that it, it comes up uh, sometimes is is everything. That's one of the criticisms I've heard some people about that rally therapy brain, blames everything on relationships. But I, I think the thing we remember also, the most important relationships are the relationship someone has with themselves. Yes. And, and, and I can't think of a problem or issue that could come up that your relationship with yourself isn't somehow involved in that. So even if it, I mean, uh, what might be uh, a question? It may be someone says, "Well, I, I don't have any relationship problems, but I'm just so depressed. You know, I'm just so depressed, but I, I get along with everybody. Body fine. Well, what about your? What about how you see yourself? Do you like yourself? Do you right. use those 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 deadly habits with yourself? And it always." Um, so far, I mean, it, it always seems if, if it's, it's not a relationship with someone else, there's some aspect of the relationship with someone's self that is a a factor there. So I think when people make that criticism, they're they're maybe not taking consideration. You know that the relationship with yourself is the one relationship that you're never going to leave or lose. Right, and I think you're you're hitting the nail right on the head. You know, so a, a client that I've been seeing for a few weeks now, and he came in today, and he has difficulty with feeling. So, you know, he's a little bit numb, depressed, but he does not like people mm -hmm. and tries to stay away from them, basically, and doesn't, doesn't wants to have a life without them. He, you know, he's the kind of guy that would, he, he's clean cut, military looking guy, but he'd just soon be, be living in the woods alone. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, he's got a job where he has to involve himself with people in order to recruit them and bring them into the military. And um, he started out session recently with, um, you know, I'm very blunt with people and people are perceiving me as having this uh, crusty exterior. And he starts telling me, you know, I call a grease monkey a grease monkey. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just fine. I'm not offended by it, but other people are saying they're offended by it. And mm -hmm. as the conversation goes on, uh, trying to guide him into some self-evaluation there, my question to him basically was, you know, so if you're using that terminology towards somebody else, what do you think their perception of you is in regards to your mechanical ability? And do you, you know, and if you were referring to yourself, if you're, if you're putting that person on that level, when do you lift your own abilities up? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Because mm -hmm. that's where it was going. I mean, he's basically using this language and when he uses that language toward other people that's somewhat derogatory or, you know, um, brushed, you know, I don't know what the word is, but um, mm -hmm. this difficult language, he uses that toward other people. He's also demeaning himself. Mm -hmm right other people can't have a, a, a more accurate perception of him and he can't have an accurate perception of himself right 
he's just reiterating you know the whole world is grease monkeys they're not mm -hmm. professional mechanics and they're not lifted up they're grease monkeys yeah mike has got a question for you. mike sure yes oh yes. mike uh earlier when you started you said that you did a lot of work with teaching new counselors and uh people in the field service providers and things with reality therapy and you had some thoughts about that you wanted to share um you you people in the field uh, yes um uh, with um a lot of clinicians uh coming in to uh the, the field they uh they may or may not have had any exposure to really these these ideas uh they get a lot of exposure in like um cognitive behavioral therapy motivational interviewing uh but reality therapy may be kind of uh, is kind of new kind of different so um but one of the things that uh, i guess uh, was mentioned earlier about um using some of these uh what would be evidence-based techniques because that comes up from from time to time sure. is that with with uh Reality therapy, when I do a, uh, like a, do, do a demonstration for people that aren't as familiar with reality therapy, uh, they think that I'm doing an integrated approach of cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing and solution focused, or they may see other things in there because, um, you know, there's, uh, a, a lot you know, in many ways, some of the techniques reality therapy may have techniques that are similar to a, a lot of, similar with a lot of other approaches to doing therapy. They just, the theory behind why you're using them is different. Well, most of them stole, stole the, the stuff from choice theory and renamed it and <laughs> rebranded it. <laughs> yeah. Or my biased you know, opinion. It, it, yeah. Who knows? You know, there's a, uh, uh, good yes, therapy is good therapy. Time. <laughs> good therapy is good therapy and one thing that the research shows regardless of what kind of therapy you're doing it's the relationship with the client is the no, the best predictor of success in therapy uh studies show that over and over again it's it's more important than any theory that use it's the relationship with with the person you're helping and then the thing that's se second most important is mutually agreed upon goals and reality therapy is as strong as any method in those two areas relationships and then getting input from the clients on their treatment plan we, we've been asking them what do you want long before person-centered recovery planning even existed so mike um i'm noticing a lot more um insurance audits they're wanting um like anthem medicaid um medicare doing a lot more auditing what mm -hmm. have you experienced when your charts are audited as far as their comments about the treatment planning? Um, there's a scale. We have a, there's a point scale for our treatment plans and they're graded on a four point scale. And one that, uh, the last review, um, mine got like a 3.66, which is, really good i know that it wasn't wasn't perfect but because there's things they're looking in there like they want you to include like natural supporter interventions in, in your plans which would be unpaid people that are going to be involved in a treatment well some of our our clientele do not may not have a natural support uh, they're 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 that low on support so it no i mean you could read after you read my book, are you going to be able to write perfect plans? Give it no, but I I can if you follow it. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can get at least an A minus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least an A minus. Pretty darn good. I, I I think there was only one other plan in the agent. Mine was 3.6. Somebody got a a 3.9, but they didn't have to include uh, as much stuff because they were in an inpatient setting. So. Um, yeah, you can use this these ideas with uh, 
any setting. And, you know, and I haven't heard insurance companies giving me a hard time about using reality therapy. Uh, there was a grant that was involved. It was a, what was called a, a system of care five grant. And I was asked to help write that because they couldn't get it approved otherwise. So I, I, I wrote a description of how to do, put together any home therapy program. And uh, they wanted to have evidence-based or evidence-informed or evidence-supported. Well, uh, now reality therapy is evidence-based in Europe. And in the United States, it is evidence-supported and evidence-informed. So they were perfectly fine with me using uh, reality therapy. And now I didn't, to, to keep them happy, add some other things in there, uh, like um, motivational interviewing and also some syst systematic training for effective parenting, which comes from Madlerian. But all that can easily integrate. One of the beauties of reality therapy is that when practice, it, it can be practiced as an open system and can be easily integrated to whatever other methods or techniques you want to incorporate into it. For example, lots of agencies are spending tremendous amounts of money on cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing. The reason why they're having trained them in both is because they're realizing the research is showing that cognitive behavioral therapy is really effective. The research really shows it's great when you got people that are in that preparation stage of change or in the action stage of change. The research isn't so good, though, when they're in that, uh, that uh, pre-contemplative stage of change or contemplative stage of change. So that's why they're now adding motivational interviewing because motivational interviewing focuses on something that sometimes the cognitive behavioral uh, theorists forget about, and that's the relationship with the client. With reality therapy, you've got that built into it. You've got the, the how-to, the cognitive behavioral uh, techniques, but you also got, like motivational interviewing, that focus on building that relationship with, with the, the person. Uh, even psychology today defines uh, reality therapy as a person-centered form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, cognitive behavioral therapy, evidence-based, person-centered, Recovery plan, evidence based. I mean, that's enough research right there for me. Yeah, Jeannie Curry has, Jeannie her, has her hand up. Yes. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Where is she? Jeannie? Jeannie, go ahead. Oh, she, she left us. Okay. Um, Wait, you've got a good amount of time left, Mike. Okay. Uh, you like to move in a, you've talked a, quite a bit about how you use reality therapy in uh, treatment planning, but we promise the folks and so much more. What else right. would you like to discuss? Well, I want to talk about different ways of using reality therapy. And for uh, a lot of my training was with, uh, Bob Walbeding using the WDP, and that's a great way to learn the procedures that lead to change uh, using the WDP. Um, but also, you know, later on, I, I got exposed to uh, Lucy, your your acronym, uh, APECA, and mm -hmm. uh, I see some advantages to teaching that delivery system of the procedures of of change. And uh, for for the ones of you who may not be uh, or, or do you want to go through the APECA or, uh, or oh, I can I, you do it better than okay. I do. Uh, okay. I just will give it a background is that I was working in Malaysia and um, Singapore and also a little bit in Japan in a culture mm -hmm. that where questions aren't uh, encouraged and uh, parents don't teach their children to question things. They teach them to listen. They're great listeners. They, and they teach them to take in information. Uh, you know, we know that they are top scholars from taking in so much information, but they aren't taught to question so much. So going in with this and trying to teach them to question, I was hitting some walls. And so I came up with nouns to describe the questions so that they get the information first and then apply it into the questions. So right. go ahead with that. Yes, and that's one of the advantages. Because so sometimes uh, when teaching the WDP, s some people get the the misunderstanding that it's just a questioning process. 
that these are just questions to gather information. What what do you want the D stands for? What are you doing? The evaluation is what you're doing, helping, and then the plan, what we do differently. And they say, but, yeah. but those 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 questions yeah. do do more than just uh oh yeah act as information giving. They're also uh they can be used really as uh, information giving questions. They're sending messages like the question, what do you want? I mean, it, it, it says to the client, your opinion is important. Uh, uh, what are you doing? It, we're sending the message that there's, there's something here that you have some control over. Um, the, the evaluation question, you're, you're kind of sending that indirect message to the client that, that they're the experts of their own quality world. And then the plan, what can you do differently? It's sending a message of hope. And, and so um, it, it's more than just a question process. And so that's one of the advantages I see of like uh, the A in a PECA stands for awareness. So uh, that's pretty comparable to the, the D in the WDP, which is asking, what are you doing? But also I think it re helps, helps remind me that we're helping people become aware of their total behaviors. We're helping them become aware of why they, I mean, they may not be even aware why they're really in therapy, what really brought them there. So helping them become aware that, you know, they may have actually made a decision. I mean, they may have been mandated for treatment, but they actually made a decision to be here. Yeah. Uh, so that's I, important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's amazing when, when, when we ask somebody what they want, I mean, they tell you a lot of different things. I'm sure, you know, we've all heard mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But then when um, you get down to nuts and bolts and you're teaching them, as you said, you're asking them, that, what do you want in this? And you provide information about wants mm -hmm. and, uh, having to do with the needs. I mean, people get well so quickly because they have clarification on what the basic needs mm -hmm. are. Mm-hmm. So I think that goes along with what you were saying there in providing information base in those questions. Yes, we're, we're, we're giving Hi. them uh, information as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's a question in the chat that says, I'm a grad student nearing the end of my program with your varied background. What would you do differently in the treatment planning with children slash adolescents versus adults? Okay, and then that's... someone wants to someone else wants to know um how to get your book okay so, what's the name name of the book uh let's see okay um all right so what i would do differently with adults and depending on the age of the child sometimes you may have children particularly if they're really young that may not be able to give you much input into what the treatment plan uh a lot of times how loud rely on the parent and and ask the parent what are they wanting for services and then i or i may ask the child what do you think your parent wants from you if they're old enough to give me information if they're not i may check with the parent and say what are you wanting to see and then i may then ask the child do you agree with what your mom or dad has said if they agree with it then great if they don't then i might say oh wow this is worse than i thought <laughs> no if both of you just agreed with what the issue is, I would say that this is going to be an easy treatment plan to write. But now it sounds like we got, you know, not only do do uh, does your mom expect you to do these things, you, 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 you've got it. You now have the task of convincing her that you're doing these things. So you got like twice as much work. <laughs> so so, um, so then you know it's a relationship issue you can focus on then it opens the door wide open if they, if they can't agree on, uh, on on what it is so sometimes using the uh the uh getting some input from the parent is uh is helpful particularly if you get, get children you know we, we can get children sometimes as young as four or five into the session so it's going to be difficult to uh sometimes get that input that could be i'd say one of the the, the biggest differences is that with uh, now with adolescents a lot of times you'll get i don't know responses there too <laughs> so you ask what you want but again that's where we go with the life start talking with them about their different need areas so 
who's the important people in your life? Uh, you know, you can as an area. What do you do for? What do you like? What do you enjoy doing? Your interests, your hobbies. Uh, um, what is something you would like to learn? If you go through those five, you can. I mean, you can just have a good conversation with anybody going through those those basic needs, and uh, so that that's one way with allies. If they say, I don't. If they say I don't know, just talk with them about the those five need areas. I can promise you there'll be things come up that uh, they can tell you about that are 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 related to uh, to uh, the the basic needs. So yeah, that was a nice well, answer, Mike. But don't forget to off your book one more time. Where can they get it? Okay. All right. I'm gonna type that in here. So. Uh, yeah you can get it on uh, any major distributor amazon or in any any major distributor uh you can find it it's uh oh hey mike i put a link to it in the chat okay thank you Um, so we're talking about awareness. There's other ways other than asking what are you doing and connecting the total behaviors through your reflections and your paraphrase, connecting the total behaviors together. Uh, that's another way of, uh, of doing it. So uh, one. About I, I, awareness, I would, Mike, uh, I, I say all the time. People will never change until they're aware of what they're doing or what mm -hmm. they're thinking. There's right. no change going to ever occur if they're not aware. So oh, yes. why does he keep doing that? It's because he's not aware he's doing that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, and the action component being the part of themselves they're least likely to be uh, aware of. So um going through a segment of their day, how they're spending their time would be another way of, of helping with the uh, awareness as, as well. Um, the, uh, the, the purpose, the second element being the purpose, and this is analogous to the W in the WDP. Uh, what is the, per the, the purpose? So helping that person you're working with see the quality world picture that's connected to their their behavior now they're aware of their behavior what what quality world is what picture is that related to uh and so this can be a time that you can uh also uh introduce the idea of needs quality world pictures exploring perceptions um like helping them become this is where it overlaps with awareness. The purpose of the behavior and what message are they sending to other people with their behavior? Um, the evaluation. And of course, this is, uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, metaphors and analogies. You know, Glasser's got the car analogy. Uh, I came up with one of my own. It's a sandwich. And the reality therapy sandwich the buns of the sandwich are the relationship and the self-evaluation because that's what holds all the other components together. And so that's, so when asked, how does, what separates reality therapy from other methods? I'd say that you probably interviewed most people who practice it. That would be what I would expect your answer would be is that the emphasis on the relationships and the self-evaluation because no other approach really emphasizes those two things as much as reality therapy does. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, the uh, evaluation, not just of the, uh, the purpose of the behavior and whether or not it's working, but also uh, their, 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 their wants is helping them become aware of um, is, is what, what the, they want realistic or within their control. Uh, the thing I most appreciate about uh, Lucy's uh, APEC acronym is choice, because I think 
it's implied in the WDP, but I'm not so sure. I, I see a lot of times when it's used after the evaluation, people want to rush into the plan. The choice is important here because this is having that person kind of look in the mirror and say, do you want to continue the route that you're going or do you want to do something different? You want to stay where you are or do something different? Uh, so I think that's an important piece that sometimes is left, uh, can be left out or forgotten about. It's, it's really easy to, after a self-evaluation, rush into a plan without going to that, that choice component. Um, and another thing, uh, and I'm not sure if, if you would fit this in there or not, Lucy, but uh, I included the language of choice theory in there is that when we're listening to someone that we're working with and they're using an external control language like um, um, I, I had I had to come here today. I had no no option. And then or um, I had I had to to hit that person because they offended me. They made me so angry. And we reflect back to them. You were so angry at the time. It didn't seem like to you like you had any other decision you could make. That's a subtle paraphrase, but you just taken that external control language and now translate it into the language of choice theory. And it's a, it's it's very subtle. It's very smooth. But after about thirty minutes of doing that with a lady, and I did primarily just reflections with her because I just listened. At the end of it, I said, well, what's your takeaway from today? She says, well, I need to stand up for myself more. I never told her that. That was something she heard in a paraphrasing where I was just reflecting back her exter external control language into the language of choice theory. So that's another way to do, to use reality therapy without uh, the necessarily relying on questions. Mm -hmm. uh, exploring. Part of the choice also exploring other quality world pictures. Sometimes people are stuck on this is the only way I can, if I don't have what I want, I, you know, I can't be happy. Well, helping them find alternative pictures that can satisfy their, their needs. Um, and then the, the action component or the action part of this, very similar to the planning, what will the person do differently and, um, I think looking at what stage of change a person is in is really important here. So if you've got someone that's in the action stage of planning, that's, that plan is going to look a lot different than someone who's in the contemplative stage of change and what kind of plan you're going to, you're probably going to have a more contemplative plan than an action plan. So, right. so, so yes. that kind of, does that overlap a little bit with evaluation and choice? Yes. They, so, I believe they all over overlap. It's kind yeah. of, I think it's impossible to really and separate one completely from another. So uh, they they blend they blend together. They really do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another part of the evaluation I look at is how does a person define what their their problem or issue is. It's it's is there a difference between what they want and what they have? For instance, uh, um, when uh, we were talking earlier about the gentleman who says he, he doesn't like people, mm -hmm. if he were asked, well, when you, you uh, when, uh, are they, are, are, are when, they, when they say they're offended by what you do, does that, does, does that matter? Is that important to you? Uh, I'd be interested to see what he would have to say. So, uh, but yeah, I've had this that, that seem to say, I don't like people, but yet at the same time, they're very concerned about what other people think. Right. <laughs> and so, okay, if Mike, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Mike, you Go have ahead. about five minutes to wrap up and finish up and answer up any last questions. Okay, I'm gonna, let's see, did I miss anything? Uh, there's no you've got all the questions from the chat sylvia has her hand up still okay Sydney. nope maybe not 
<clears throat> I asked the question, how to get your book. And um, I think you answered it. I hope so. Oh, it's, uh, you can get it through uh, iUniverse Publishing or Amazon or can any you get major it on the distributor. Website? Can you get it on the Institute website still? Mm, no, it's not on okay. on there. It, it, it years ago when it was an ebook, you could, but it it's now it's gotten so uh, a much larger book. It's too big for an ebook, and okay, too big for them to want to sell it. So, <laughs> yeah. what do you want folks to? So are you saying? Okay, so are you saying, Mike, that um, the original book you have was an ebook? I have it. If mm. you have an updated or revised oh, book. Oh yes. That that ebook that you have, that was an yes. unfinished product. That's what I sent Kim over. It was not okay. It was not done, but she she was so excited about it. She said, What do you want to sell it for? And I agreed to sell it on the website, but it was not a finished product. Um yeah, that's that's I mean it had person centered elements, but that's before I had more training and person-centered recovery planning. So I, I okay. took what I'd been doing before, then learned person-centered recovery planning and fit reality therapy and choice theory into person-centered recovery planning. So there's quite a progression from 2013 okay. to 2020. I'd say that first edition, I'd say 70% of the information is new. Uh, looks like sure. I need to buy the book again. Steve, yeah, there's a chat in there for you. Can you please uh, look at it? Well, um, go ahead. Mike. There, there is one point I want to make. There was a progression. 2013 was the ebook. In 2015, I, the uh, I redid the ebook because I didn't feel like you know it was finished. 2015, I, I published treatment planning with reality therapy. That came out in 2015. Then in 2020 was treatment planning with choice theory and reality therapy. So when you go online, if you go to purchase the book, make sure you get the ones got choice theory in the title, because that's the yeah. latest version. Because there's about there was about 20% new information between 2013 and the 2015 version. There was about 40% new information from uh, 2015 to 2020. So. Uh, I guess it's one thing I learned from Glasser is to, to, to continually be evolving and, pr and improving your work, <laughs> you know, so well, yeah. there, there, well, and I can tell you what, I could read the 20, well, I'll go back and look at the 2020 book. There's things I could say that could be better. So <laughs> yeah. we just, yeah. I just uh, want to go to one of the comments. I don't know who made it, that we are not in this any way saying anything derogatory about WDEP. Right. I hope no one heard that. Okay, that's an essential part of a lot of people's learning. Um, we're just thinking about many different ways of teaching choice theory and reality therapy. And that's part mm -hmm. of what this, what we want this to be is conversation. Sometimes we get lots of numbers of people on here, so we don't get a lot of conversation. We want to hear from a lot of people. So in the last couple of minutes, let's hear from some of you about this subject that Mike brought so well today. There's a comment in the chat box. Jeffrey Chan said, thanks for sharing. He's got to go. It's 1 a.m. where he is. So thank you, Jeffrey, for <laughs> okay, joining you. us. Yeah. Others? I need to definitely get better at it, Mike. I may have to buy your, um, your newest book. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's the thing is looking for different ways. I use the WD, WDP. That's how I learned it. It's a great way of uh, teaching it. There are advantages also using other ways, uh, just like the total behavior. Glasser's got uh, the total behavior car. I also use uh, Wobbling's uh, suitcase analogy because there's some things with the suitcase that I, I think are just easier to teach than from the car. So, you know, I, I don't want to get stuck in just one way of teaching things. For one thing, uh, and that's what I'll say to any faculty member, make sure you do it. Because I, I, uh, I, I work a lot with Bob Wobbledy. I get a lot, like if I could do a certification week, I was intimidated the first time I had to follow. And I was like, oh my gosh, uh, 
I got his people. What can I teach them? Because I thought, well, I'm not going to try to teach WDEP because number one, I can never teach it as well as he does. But what I can do is teach other things that he doesn't. And so that's, that's how I found the way to be effective when you're having to follow, like, you know, that's following Lucy. I'm, I'm not going to teach, a I'm going to teach other things because I'm not going to be able to teach it as well as she does. Or I'm going to teach maybe things, but, but that's, that's one thing I would recommend is fine. I mean, uh, I think I learned that from uh, uh, being a musician. You know, I, as, as Lucy said, I'm an Elvis impersonator. Well, I knew I wasn't going to make it in, in the music business because there's already been an Elvis and I'll never be able to top that. So I learned for the music business, you got to do something different. And so that's, <laughs> well, I think when I was in my first certification or first training week with Dr. Wobelding, uh, the comment that he made to me personally as he went around to groups and kind of listened and watched what was going on, he encouraged me to, to continue to be creative with mm -hmm. the information that I was yes. getting from the Choice Theory platform. So I, I don't think it, you know, I, I think we, we uh, do well to teach people that the acronym concept Mm -hmm. is important and some people that i've worked with just they come up with phenomenal acronyms for themselves yes that are you know they they have more control over they're they're more intimate with and so forth and so it's good well yeah, i want to um i'm sorry i want to thank dr bob he is actually on the on the screen with us by phone he could not get logged in so he is with us has been with us today appreciate him very much and everybody else yes. Wendell, you got your hand up? Or are you saying goodbye? I know we're over. Yeah, uh, Lucy uh, and, and Mike, I didn't understand Lucy's acronym. What were the letters? Oh, uh, APECA uh, Awareness. Well, and, and give me the letters. A-P-E-C-A. Uh, A-P-E-C-A. Which stands for? Go, Mike. Oh, awareness, <laughs> which is similar to the the D in, in W in the WDP, um, and then the the P is purpose, which is like the W, and then the E, the evaluation. Which is the same as the E in WDP, and then the uh, choice, C is choice, and A is action, which probably fall under, I guess, planning would be, but there's overlap in, in, uh, in all of this. So like I said, I teach it both ways, and I'll let the students decide which is uh, what's, what's going to be Best. There's advantages. There's, there's advantages either way you go. All right. Just to finish up, too, uh, Mike, I appreciate your comment about uh, uh, Dr. Robling's uh, teaching of WDEP, but only a few people are going to get exposed to him. You're going to have exposure to a lot of other people. So all of us sharing and giving credit to uh, ex ex spreads, continues to spread out a wonderful. Mm -hmm usable concept that's so much there. I also want to take a quick uh, a shout out. Uh, Steve Hammond just checked out. Steve Hammond, for those of you who don't know, recently retired as the principal of the St. Patrick's Catholic School in Norfolk, Virginia. And it was the very first Catholic quality school. And it's what a superb, uh, uh, operation there. He's retired. He's available for people to invite to come to your communities to do things on school and quality school and mental health. So I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, put something together for him down here in Florida. But anyway, he's a phenomenal resource who's currently available, not tied down to a job. Thank you. Thank you, Wendell. Lucy, we want to announce what we're doing next month or who our speaker is next month before we close because we're over. Well, I believe it's Dr. Wobbling, isn't it? I think so. I believe it is. Yeah. And I think he's going to, I believe he told me he'd like to talk about uh, bringing the, 
defining the past might be his subject okay. or part of his subject. So we'll be right back here. Be we'll be right back here, same day, same time next month, and uh, look forward to seeing you all back. Thank you again, Mike. You did a phenomenal job. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for Great having job, me. Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, hold on for a minute, if you don't mind. Okay. Everyone else, thank you very much. Is there further discussion after we stop? um no. recording or is it uh, a, no just it? with mike okay yeah we're, we're okay. finished thank take you take care folks thanks everybody thanks mike. okay bye now thank you um it's trying to so um, do you want me to go can... too <laughs> no no not at all just need a short write-up of what you think the common themes were doesn't have to be lengthy um I love the integration with the person-centered and the motivational interviewing because unfortunately in our world we're working in today, that's what's expected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you can do so, reality therapy and they won't know the difference. They just think you're combining the two. That's been my experience. <laughs> yeah. But I so think you really they think you do it really well. <laughs> yeah. If you'll shoot me a little blurb. So what we're gonna do is, oh, I need to end the video. Hold on a second.